This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, and you're listening to Python's Paradise, your film and music show, and this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, we're celebrating 45 years of Fritz the Cat, and we're going to be celebrating 45 years of its director, yes, Ralph Bakshi, on the phone with me. Ralph, I am so honored to have you on today. Thank you so much. Well, my pleasure. Yes, I mean, I, I've been wanting to do this for a long, long time, and I, I know there's a few, there was a few hang-ups along the way, but um, I really appreciate having you come on and, uh, and um, celebrating this uh, wonderful landmark as a uh, I was born in 1972, and that was when Fritz the Cat was released. Oh, jeez. Okay, kid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Fr- Fritz the Cat, of course, came, of course, from the the Robert Crumb uh, uh, book, and, uh, of course, uh, became quite a, an interesting animation, but... Uh, you know, before we get into Fritz, I'm just wondering if you give us just a little bit of your background. What do you mean my background? Like, you know, getting into uh, film and into directing, and like, did you did you always want to go into animation? Oh, I see. I got you. No, not really. Um, first of all, I, I'm older than you. <laughs> I was born in 1938, <laughs> so um, I I grew up during the uh, 40s. And the big deal, or the thing that I loved the most, was the comic strip. In other words, um, when newspapers were really important before the internet, um, the comic strip was something that every cartoonist, and that's what I wanted to be, every cartoonist wanted to have their own comic strip. Animation, which is uh, a very big deal now, wasn't always the case in the 50s and the 40s when I was coming in the 50s when television came out at, um, animation was starting to crumble uh, meaning that the cartoon shorts which kept the business alive that was Warner Brothers and MGM um, and Lance and other people were no longer needed to fear so the only person they could feature films in those days was Disney. Uh, so animation was on the downswing as far as unemployment. So you took a job in animation at Terry Toons, like I did, to get a job. Everyone needs a job, even a cartoonist. Um, well, we all waited for a comic strip, a comic book, an illustration, which was a very big deal. So um, I was never... I was never interested in movies, nor was I interested in movie reviews. Um, I went to the movies. I loved the movies, but I wasn't interested in becoming a film director. My, uh, I was way above and out of my league. I, was, I grew up in Brooklyn in a very small neighborhood, so my dream was to become a comic strip artist. And that was my background. So I went to art school, high school, went to art school, industrial design. And after I graduated from uh, high school, I won an award, a cartooning award, um, in high school. It was an art school. Terry Tins gave me a job as an inker. An inker of self, which means you sit there inking drawing. <laughs> this is way back. It's a big you know, with a crow quill pen, no less. So, and then, you know, animation was what I started to fall in love with once I had a job. It wasn't my first love, no. Well, uh, of course, your, your your first film, Fritz Fritz the Cat, what drew you to Fritz the Cat? <laughs> what drew me? Well, that's a long story, but let me try to shorten it so I don't bore anyone now. First of all, the... Uh, <clears throat> My age and who I, I mean, it's hard to begin, you know, it's hard to place anything really. My age and who I was in my young 20s and middle 20s um, was part of my culture. And part of my culture was very much into uh, jazz, rock and roll, we, uh, which was cr- 
created during my boyhood, not by me, but by a lot of people, um, and the protest and chairs and, act, and abstract paintings. So my, my upbringing in Brooklyn itself, my upbringing was one of um, the avant-garde writers, um, Jack Kerouac, uh, et cetera. So that was me. Then the underground comics started, which, you know, obviously it was right up my alley. I mean, every young guy um, loved underground comics because it was more pertinent to what was happening in the real world. And the real world was uh, getting to be flaky. Now, I was never a Disney fan, only in as much as I was spared my childhood having not enough money to go to the movies to see Disney. And Disney features did not play in my neighborhood much, because it was an immigrant, very poor neighborhood. So I wasn't brainwashed when I was a young man uh, to think that Disney was the only voice that animation should have. So that was very important later on with every other animator in the business. When I got a job at Terry to start an animation, I was shocked at everyone's um, complete um, abandonment to Disney. In other words, he's great, no question about it. The animation was great, no question about it. But every animator, old and young, thought this is the only way, and this was called quality, and quality was important. And any time anyone ever started to do a film on their own, they couldn't finish it. It's still true today, because they didn't have enough money for the quality of one's quality. Quality is redoing something over and over and over again. If you've got the money to make it perfect, and that's fine. Who doesn't want to do that? But that doesn't mean um, that if you're a little under quality or a lot under quality, I still think the idea is more important than the quality of animation. I mean, you try to do the best quality you can. But if the idea is strong enough, then the idea will live past whether your animation is uh, Milk Call or some of the top animators. Um, now, if you're doing children's animation, which Disney did, um, then you need the quality. You need all the effects and everything because the story, though, is fairy tale is fine. But it lives on those touches uh, that make it seem like it's important. But something like Fritz the Cat or Heavy Traffic lives on what the characters are doing and saying and how they're acting, you know, or even what religion they are, you know. In Heavy Traffic, Angie, Michael's father, um, was Italian and loved the mafia and didn't like black people. And the, Michael's uh, girlfriend was black, and his mother was Jewish. I mean, you, you get involved in areas the animation never touched on. Um, you try to make the animation as good as possible, but to me, it was always more important to get the uh, picture made, or better yet, get your ideas out, which is what the underground comics were all about. So, of course, I was drawn to Crump, because he's great. I was drawn to Spain Rodriguez, who I loved dearly. Vaughn Bodie, who I love with a passion. Um, Gilbert Sheldon. And, you know, so I was drawn to the guys that were my age and were drawing. Um, and um, uh, so it's a long-winded thing to let you know that I was drawn to Crump because he, I was drawn to a lot of people. Um, in those days. Now the reason, um, so that that's sort of an answer. Is that an answer? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, Fr Fritz the Cat, of course, voiced by uh, Skip Hennick, who uh, really brought um, a great personality to the character. I, I notice a lot of uh, interesting themes to Fritz the Cat, like with um, you know the black crows and the the the. The, the neighborhood, the, uh, the the culture that was going on at the time in terms of, of course, religion, and, and of course you have um, 
of course, the nudity, like the orgy in the bathtub, and basically just coming off of Woodstock with all that sex and freedom pre-AIDS uh, um, era. Um, was that uh, on, on your mind any when you were um, making this film? Well, the, the, the <laughs> with sex on my mind. <laughs> uh, um, listen, let me... Uh, it's a very simple question. Nothing was on your mind. If you're a young man, right, and also young men, I mean, young men know what's going on around them. If you're a young man that's free from brainwashing, right, if you're a young man that's part of your time, it wasn't really that remarkable to do animation on the kind of stuff that I was interested in, which is politics, urban politics, uh, religion and all the things that I got involved with in animation because that's what every young person was getting involved in. In other words, it wasn't where it was on my mind where I came from Mars. You know, every young guy was on the mind. Everyone was taking pot. Everyone was walking around the East Village and everyone was protesting the war in Vietnam and everyone was listening to Bobby Dylan. <laughs> you know, as Bobby Dylan became Bobby Dylan, but the young people knew what he was saying, not because the older people did. So um, it wasn't where I was doing anything that special um, to my to what I was thinking about. What was special about it was everybody in animation never did it and thought that I was out of my mind for doing it. Uh, <laughs> in other words, they were still saying, they were still wishing upon a star with Pinocchio and worrying about fairy dust while, while the inner cities were burning and soldiers were getting killed in Vietnam for no reason. So, you know, um, I had a harder time not with the public. I had a very hard time with the animated, you know, people who felt I somehow had destroyed uh, the goodness and the wholesomeness of animation with my blasphemy. But that was the same thing the underground cartoonists were up against in the beginning. Um, don't forget, in the 50s, this, this, this guy Worthman said that all comic books were driving kids to pornography and to gang rumbles, and the comic book industry nearly collapsed. That was the Worthman thing, and he uh, caused us to have the comic codes and all the other stuff. So tremendous censorship um, at all levels. Um, so I don't find it very special or very, no light bulb had to go up in my head. Now, if I had grown up as a young man, and maybe I've often thought of this, if I had grown up as a young man in Brownsville, and my mother gave me money to go see a Disney movie, and I'd still roll the Disney movies as a young man, meaning eight, nine, ten, I might have been one of those guys who came out and saying, if it ain't Bambi, it's no good, you know. Um, I don't know, but the point is I never went to see a Disney movie when I was young. So by the time I got old enough to be animated, um, it wasn't, I, I, the few that I saw, I appreciated, but it wasn't in my mentality as a young man uh, that this is the only way that God could live in animation to do with this kind of stuff. So, so what I'm saying is I was part of my time and I don't see it being uh, revolutionary, except if you were an animator, and, that, and in that case, maybe it was revolutionary. One but thing, not because you were a young man. Yeah. One thing, I, I, there's a few scenes I wanted to point out. One, you had a, a nice musical interlude in there with, uh, um, I think it was a crow, and it was... Um, had Bo Diddley playing, you know, and it was just a nice musical in, interlude with Bo Diddley. And uh, what what inspired that? Well, that's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, first of all, there were two things happening there, okay? Bo Diddley is about rock and roll. I also was the first to use rock and roll and jazz in an in animated cartoon. You think of that. Yeah. Now, why that? Why was I able to do that? Was because that was again music that I loved, as opposed to Pat Boone, you know. Um, or let's see what the Disney crowd loves. And we're not putting Disney out. 
Don't get me wrong. I'm just discussing the difference. Every man should pick what he likes and loves and go for it. Okay. So I'm thinking about how do I enter a ghetto? Because I'm going to Harlem now. We're going from, as a director and a writer, uh, I'm concerned about how do I get from the East Village College, NYU, to Harlem. And what, how do I get there? How do I get there? <clears throat> and I'm trying to then say, okay, wait a minute. I'm trying to show that Harlem is a ghetto. And all ghettos are isolated from the rest of the world. So I had the idea of starting the ghetto on a very, Harlem, on a very small little square in black, which is what a ghetto is. It's nowhere. It's surrounded by a city, but it's really all alone. And then to get into this ghetto, I needed a song. And I picked Bo Diddley because it was to be very black. And I could have this crow standing there in the foreground, snapping his fingers at the rhythm. So it took a long time for me to truck into this little square, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it became Harlem. And it's, to me, one of the finest shots I've ever done. I love that as far sequence. As being a director and solving two or three problems changing the music from, you know, East Village bullshit to um, rock and roll, heavy black, and then entering a ghetto to show audiences what ghettos are all about, which are isolation. So I, I'm very proud of that. Um, I had two, kind of two or three moments I was very happy with the Fritz. The other one was the pool ball. Well, I was just going to bring that up, ghetto. yeah. I was just well, going to bring it yeah, up. Obviously, you know what you're talking about, it seems to me. I had no idea. You could bring it up. Go ahead. Yeah, where, where, the, ah. where there's the shootout and the, the, the black crow gets shot and he has his heartbeat. And every time his heart beats, there's like, a, you know, the, a pool ball bouncing and it goes into the hole. And I love it when the camera pans back and it goes all white and it cracks. And then the, the, it's, it's the crow's eye and he, he dies and the smoke comes out of his mouth. I thought that was brilliant, Ralph. I thought that was great. Well, thank you. Well, look, first of all, again, same problem, okay? This is me becoming a director. I mean, this is right, the same problem. First of all, when you write your own movies, like I did, and you have full control of them, like I have my own company, no one's, I don't have to answer to anybody. So I can think whatever I want to think, so that was a very important thing. But those two shots, in another animation studio, might not have been approved. Let me be very clear. So, a lot of freedom which I took. Secondly, all right. We opened up Duke, who the crow that got shot. Duke was a black pool player. He opened up playing pool with Fritz the Cat. You know, he was yep. shooting pool and he was shooting pool ball. So as a pool player, who was a pool hustler, as his life was ebbing away, I decided to use the pool ball, each one dropping in the hole, to signify him dying. Um, again, wanting to do two things. His life as a pool player, his life now getting, you know, going the way of the pool ball. So that was the reason for that. Uh, where those shots came from, because I had never done shots like that in Terry too. You know, some, some couple of remarkable things happened to me on Fritz, which I never understand. Uh, well, maybe at Terry Tunes, because the stuff was still very much child-oriented. The minute I got my hands on adult material, my thinking changed as an animation director. I was able to think as an adult. You see, animation directors are forever thinking as children. So it's... I was able to think as an adult and make some directorial moves that surprised even me. Um, and I learned from that. Oh, that. That's what got me into heavy traffic because uh, I was startled by the potential of those two scenes. Um, and they were my favorite scenes. Yeah, I, I love that. Another thing, too, I really enjoyed in Fritz the Cat is, again, you get the music in the background where you introduce the drug, drug addict uh, bunny, the biker bunny. And I love that music that plays as you see his feet coming down. You see his... He, <laughs> yeah, well, that was easy. 
Uh, oh, that, that's great. Friends. That's great stuff, Ralph. I mean, fantastic well, stuff. Well, I like the one in Harlem with Billy Holiday. You know, when, when we went into Harlem, I, I introduced a song yesterday. Now, you have to understand, okay, I bought a Billy Holiday song for use in a movie, right? Mm -hmm. For $2,000. I bought Bo Diddley for 500 bucks. I bought uh, Maybelline. I mean, no one used rock and roll. But after that, you couldn't afford to buy a, a Maybelline for less than $200,000. You know, but I, nobody ever went to rock and roll to use in a movie, especially an animated movie. So I bought it. I was able to afford it. Don't forget, a very low budget. So as opposed to writing new music that was bad, right, mm -hmm. by a bad composer, I was able to pick up the greatest music of my life for no money, for less than I would take me to record to the chunk. It was a win-win situation. What, what was so the, what, I, I was very happy to be able to use uh, music that I grew up with and loved. In heavy traffic, I used the Take Five, yeah. one of the greatest all-time jazz hits of the world, you know, um, to introduce Angie. And box, I think, you know. What I'm saying is, why am I saying this? I'm saying there is a way to do, to do low-budget films. If you use your head as a director, you could find you could find stuff that's better for you than if you had a lot of money and you're able to spend it. If I had a lot of money for the music, right, I probably would have hired a composer and for Hollywood, and the guy would have come in and written some crap. Right, that would have stuck in my movie. But um, being able to pick and choose Scarborough Fair in heavy traffic, my God, these are magnificent songs. Um, you know what you get. Music is very important in a movie, right? Yeah. Very important. So I, I use music a lot. With and I learned to use music from being a teenager and driving in my car with my girlfriend and having the radio on. I mean, what do you do? You're cruising, right? You're listening to the song. So emotionally, you know um, what music is all about. Yeah. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that, that music that's used during the, the, the bunny scene where he's got the, you know, the, the horse uses the needle to get his attention when up on that hill. And what, what, is, what was that piece of music? Okay, that piece of music was written by Fantasy Films. I forget the the guy's name is probably Fantasy Films did some intro music oh, around my yeah. big record stuff. So I forget the guy's name. It is fifty years ago. Yeah. He's a very good writer. He's, he was my age. He lived in San Francisco. In fact, all the music he wrote for Prince the Cat I liked a lot. Oh yeah. Um, and that was a piece he wrote. Um, uh, and we discussed the scene. So that was one of the pieces where I went from the original. I couldn't find anything that equal what I felt a good introduction to the buddy would be. <laughs> I didn't repeat what I had done already in the film. It's very important to try to not to repeat stuff. So I wish I could remember his name. He was a good guy. But it would be on the Fritz the Cat album or, okay. on, or in the music. Okay. Um, and the credits, look at name, but he's a very good guy. All right. He may not be around. What do I know? <laughs> did, did Fritz the Cat have much trouble with the censors when it was being released? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, but Fritz the Cat today is <laughs> just about as strong as Simpson. I mean, Fritz the Cat today would have been, could have been put on television. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I had trouble with the censors. I mean, they yelled at me, they screamed, they called me a pornographer. They asked me what right I had to do to destroy Disney's image. Oh, gee. Um, I went to L.A. to animate for the Cat because I was thrown out of New York. <laughs> and all the Disney animators and, and non-Disney animators took an ad out variety, saying that I should go back to New York with my garbage. And who was I to destroy Disney's image and blah, blah, blah. 
So it was very difficult all the way around. Um, my mother thought I was going to get shot. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't let her see the movie. <laughs> but she was a nice Jewish lady. So, so you know, yeah, it was a trouble. Yeah, it was. It was a lot of trouble. Well, it came out the same year as a lot of X-rated movies, like Pink Flamingos, Last Tango in Paris, Last House in the Left, uh, um, was it Deep Throat, uh, stuff like that. They all came out that year. Um, it's, I mean, a variety of stuff. Ah. Yeah. But you have to understand, yeah. they weren't an animation. I was treading on yeah. very sacred ground. Yeah. Because I grew up and animation was always treated different. I kept telling them I have a right to do this stuff if live action has the right to do this stuff. One of my arguments with the censor board and the people was what gives the right for Marty Scorsese to blow the brains out of people in Main Street and stuff? And I can't do the same thing in my media. True. Because Disney had such a control over the country. The mentality that animation is something you don't mess around with. Animation is only about goodness. I'm serious. It was, I was totally brainwashing. Um, I'm not putting Disney's quality down. I'm not putting him down. I'm talking about his control. And of course, for him, it was good business. You know, he's, he's all his animators saying, if you can't do it perfect, don't do it. Well, that was just a great way for people not to do what I was doing. <laughs> you know, that's why so few animated films were done during my day and before. But the quick guys couldn't afford to do it. They couldn't raise the money. If someone gave me a million dollars to do Fritz, Disney was spending $20 million on his film. Yeah. I said I would do it. Every animated town says, you can't do it. I thought that I can't do it. Of course I can do it. How? You just do it. <laughs> I mean, we didn't have pencil pens. So, uh, but anything done in animation always got a different look. Um, you know those Tijuana Bibles, those old pornographic stuff that used to be around in the 40s? Okay. Everyone thought that's what I was doing. <laughs> you know, so yeah, animation was always treated unlike life. And it's strange because it led the way to like South Park and even the last year's Sausage Party, you know, and, and Fritz kind of opened that door. Of course it did. Yeah. Yeah, of course it did. But you're not going to get anyone to admit it. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know who's going to die. I have friends. I have lots of friends. Uh, I like guys from Sausage Party, and I, I haven't seen this film. I'm glad they did it. Oh, I loved I it. I yeah. like they're the first ones to do it. We, you know, kind of annoyed with that. Um, Skip Hennick uh, played, uh, voice Skip uh, Fritz the Cat. Perfect. What, what, yeah, I, I really like the the personality he brought to Fritz. Oh, you're, you're a good guy. I'm, I'm not patronizing you. I wasn't <laughs> sure of your email. But, but, you're, but you're a good guy because I love Skip Hennick. Yeah. Skip, Skip Hennick was Fritz the Cat. He came in and did that. And I said, oh, now, the underground, the cartoon of the underground all hated Skip Hedda. Oh. They wanted the Fritzy Cat to be more like me, they said. <laughs> I said, no way. I love Skip Hedda. I thought he made the film. Oh, I agree, yep. I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you very much. Uh, I had a lot of aggregation for hiring Skip. Thank you very much, you could. I uh, thought he made for it again. Uh, you know what? I actually tried to reach out to him for an interview, but I couldn't find any contact information. But I, I, I just thought, I like... I spoke to him recently. I had a conversation with him recently. He's still around. Ah. Um, well, Eddie he's... Eddie Bakshi, my son, he might know, or oh, my Victoria. The people that you got, um, got to me from... Okay. Uh, they hooked the up with Skip. They may have that on their record. They may not, but I did talk to Skip in the last couple of years. Okay. Well, maybe I'll reach out. I, I, I thought he was fantastic, yeah. See, yeah. I gave you, if they have it, they, I gave you orders to get it. I will, I will, <laughs> I will. Use, use my muscle on my children. <laughs> <laughs> you muscle know, up. 
I was going to say, though, like, growing up, I also, like, I, like Fire and Ice, like, you did two different types of animation. You did, you know, like, your, your Fritz the Cat and your Heavy Traffic and your uh, Hey Good Looking American Pop. And then you had, like, Fire and Ice and you had Lord of the Rings. Um, the contrast between the two, did you have a preference between the two uh, styles? Another good question. Uh, first of all, I uh, I realized that I didn't want to be cop Disney um, because what that would mean the same style year after year with the minor changes. I wanted to experiment in animation, not to get bored. Making an animation film is very difficult, and I use animation as an art form as opposed to commercial vehicle. And, I, and as a cartoonist growing up, you know, I loved Frank Frazetta. You know, I loved the funny stuff. I loved the realistic stuff, you know. I loved the things that I loved. I wanted to try to make animation do that. So my change of style was, do I want to do... That's why I didn't do Fritz the Cat 2. They were begging me to do Fritz the Cat 2. I said, no, I'm going to do heavy traffic. In other words, uh, in my life of Fritz the Cat, I didn't do the... I didn't want to do a sequel um, because that spent two or three years on a film to do the same thing again. It's strictly something you do for money only. And I, as an artist, want to try to stretch the boundaries of what kind of art I could learn to do. So I love uh, Fire and Ice as much as I love Heavy Traffic, as long as I don't do Fire and Ice every other picture. You know what I'm saying? Um, a friend and I were what? I love Tolkien. I absolutely was crazy over the book. Yeah. And I've been thinking lately that I might want to do the, the next two Tolkien films. I may want to finish that. Okay. Um, because it's time. So I love Tolkien. Um, so I don't have a preference except a preference for that moment that makes me feel like an artist as opposed to some guy who's just doing it for a merchandising deal. A friend and I were watching Fire and Ice recently, you know, and uh, came out the same year as Conan the Barbarian, um, 35 years. Actually, it's celebrating its anniversary this year, 35 years, Fire and Ice. And and I remember seeing it for the first time, and I was, and, you know, you used to see in animations being um, um, careful. And here's this one, you got the blood, and you got the the axe going into the person and um, the the female nudity and you know and I I love the the detail that you brought to Fire and Ice was really really remarkable um, and uh, well thank you but you don't forget I had a pretty good artist I was working with Cole Frank from Feta. yes <laughs> I mean I did Fire and Ice also to work with Frank in other words Frank was a very dear friend of mine okay uh, in Brooklyn. I loved him. I used to hang around him and Crinkle and all the guys. Wallywood and all. When I was a Terry Tooth and a Paramount, uh, all the the best comic book artists and I were friends. Wallywood, Joe Cuba, Frank Zeta, Crinkle, Gray Morrow, Jim Steranko. Those guys were the guys I was trying to bring into animation. And I did many presentations with them, which I have at home. Um, presentations meaning drawings of shows that I wanted to do. So Frank and I were always friends. Um, and he said he'd come out to California to help me with the film. Um, plus, you know, the, I was able to, he was able to um, get a good producer salary, which is very good um, for him personally. And he was sitting at home painting all these years. He too needed a break. So it was a win-win situation. We had a ball. We had a wonderful ball. You know, Frank's unashamed of nudity. <laughs> you know, and uh, it was just a great time working with the guy. I'm sorry he's gone. You got to like that female in the movie, though. I, I, I forgot. I hadn't seen it in a while. My friend and I were watching it. We forgot how resourceful that 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 uh, female that was on the run was. And... Uh, we forgot how resourceful she was in the movie. We just thought she was, like, years back, I thought she was just running away, and it's like, she ended up being useful in some pivotal moments. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know, you know, it 
just attitudes about characters, who, who they are, what kind of people are dealing with. Um, one tries to avoid Snow White, you know, all the time. So. Yeah. Now, when you, I do. when you went from Fritz the Cat to Heavy Traffic, like, um, how did you come up with heavy traffic? Like, was was it uh, hard to come go come from Fritz the Cat to heavy traffic? Was it difficult, or did you just gradually fall into that? Well, you asked the right questions. Uh, hmm. okay. <laughs> okay. Look, two things happen. It's very interesting. This line is true. Okay. To me, it is. It may not be to people listening, but to me, it is. Okay. Um, I told you that the two surprises that came to me on Fritz the Cat were the pool ball scene, the ghetto scene, the drug addict scene, um, and then tracing backgrounds. I took photographs of real streets on Fritz the Cat. So the big deal to me was all those streets were real streets in New York. My technique was photographing the streets in New York, and then tracing over the photographs with on a cell, and then so I'd have the real street. So it was like being on location. That was just trying to get some realism into the film. No more fantasy background. Um, St. Mark Street in New York City was the street. When Fritz walked down that street, every store, every building was exactly as we photographed it. Am I clear? So, all right. So all these things happened because I was free from doing children's stuff. All these things happened. Um, and then the jazz music, Billy Holiday and all that. So some magic happened. In other words, it was a shock to me to go to Fritz the Traffic myself. But the same way that I had somehow stumbled or was free to go there because of adult animation, I took the realistic backgrounds, the music, and the bits and pieces from Fritz the Cat and pushed it into heavy traffic. And instead of doing animals, which was traditional to animation, see, mm-hmm. the minute I went to real people and then gave them religion, uh, then it all broke loose for me, like an avalanche. It was small little bits, and I was writing the script, and then it came down as another surprise. In other words, um, it was a big surprise to me, yes. But it had been set up by Fritz. Without, if I didn't do Fritz, traffic would not have been possible. After that, you followed up with Coonskin. Now, Coonskin, did you have any problems with the, the title for that when you released it back oh, in? Yeah. Fuck it out already. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've had I've been the luckiest guy in the world. And I've also been the the, uh, the most unlucky. Pick it. I never titled for I never titled Coonskin Coonskin. Okay. It was Harlem Nights, and I sold it to Paramount as Harlem Nights. The same picture. On the release, right before the release, the producer Al Ruddy, who produced the film, he had just produced The Godfather, film, the first one, right? Okay. So he was, he's a pretty um, uh, pretty strong producer, right? Decided, because he checked it out, because I was doing the first black cartoon, he didn't think anybody would show up. He titled it Coonskin, so you could start the controversy. To his mind, the controversy was what Soul Silk. Because he had been very controversial on Godfather, because he had a meeting with the Mafia. New York Times put it on the front page when he was doing the movie. And the controversy got the movie to be noted. So to him, controversy was everything. You know? Yeah. And it was his title, and I never liked it. I'll be yeah. quite honest with you. I'm not going to disavow it. You know, but in the picture, Prayer Rabbit said, Coonskin no more. It was very, everybody got it. The end of the film, he said, don't call me Coonskin no more. Um, so, I, it was tricky. It wasn't the proper title. It shouldn't have been done. There was no reason to push it. The film was very strong without the title. 
I'm very popular now. It's a very big deal. But yeah, it, did, it didn't it didn't go well because of the title. And I'll never forgive Al for doing that. You had another couple of very um, lighthearted animations that come out too. No one knows that yet, but I just told you. you know, it's okay. No, it was just something I, uh, that uh, you know I thought was need cleared up, you know. But but uh, ap- after that, of course, you ventured into, of course, Wizards and Lord of the Rings, and of course, those, of course, as we mentioned with Fire and Ice, are very very different from uh, Fritz the Cat and and Heavy Traffic, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, you mentioned you liked the Tolkien, and and then you did American Pop and Hey Good Looking, which <laughs> I'm schizophrenic. What's that? I'm schizophrenic. I- you know, on different years, I like different things. You know, um, uh, except I married to my wife for 45 years. But other than that, different years, I like different things. Um, different music. I like jazz. I like classical. I don't know. If something's good, I like it. Um, if I deem something good, I like it. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I just seem to, you know, I don't know. Most animators don't jump around like I do now. Tell me about American Pop. Oh. <laughs> well, what is it? Okay, so we start with Fritz the Cat. Mm-hmm. I buy some music on Fritz the Cat. See, everything's a, you see, everything is a continuum with me. One thing teaches you about another thing. And I think it's important that I, if there are animators listening, is listen very carefully to what you're doing it's really setting you up at the next stage. Okay, so let's take music. Okay, so I do, I pick some very key pieces in Fritz the Cat that no one ever did that was great. Mm-hmm. Everyone loved it, and I loved it. And then in every traffic, I push it further. Okay, got it? Yep. I got Scarborough Fair, I got Take Five, I got Jazz, I got Bug Rock. <clears throat> so at some point, I realized the importance of music to me and the importance of music to America. So I wanted to do a, a great musical story using all the songs that I loved growing up from the 40s. So I grew up in the 40s, I grew up born in 1938. So I grew up with swing and then rock and roll and then Bobby Dylan. So I was able to use all my musical influences over the year in one film and I wrote an outline to show how that would work with various characters and various generations of people. So it's my love of music, and my using of music in my earlier film that let me just go bigger and bigger and bigger until I did pop. See how that works? Okay. Um, and that's that's how I did. I did pop so I could discuss music and use music. The music was the inspiration for pop, and the generational thing that was a wonderful thing to do in animation. Uh, because I could then do all the music. <laughs> you did one generation, you could do all the different music. Then you, then you did Hey, Good Looking, <laughs> another another interesting uh, movie. Tell us about tell us about that film. I won't say, tell you too much. I uh, it, that's not, I tell you, lucky, unlucky. So it's another heartbreaker for me. Oh, it's a heartbreaking My one. original concept of Hey, Good Looking, which I shot and made a movie of, was four animated characters, Rosie, Vinny, Crazy, and Eva. They're the only animated characters in the picture. Everyone else was live action. And they worked in a live action world. Got that? Okay. And I shot live action and put the animated characters in, right? Okay. Warner Brothers saw the film and said that Nobody would ever go see a film like that. Meanwhile, they bought it, and now they get obviously they change. Every time a company changes its leader, it's the guy who runs it. They always get mad at the films that the other leader made. You know? They said nobody would see it, so they wanted me to throw out all the live action and reanimate it. Wow, right? Mm-hmm. So not only did I have to do that, but they were Warner Brothers, right? They wanted me to pay for it. They said it was my mistake, even though they bought the screenplay that said that. 
So it took me years to finish the picture. I did a little, um, Hey Good Lucky was done two years before Wizard. I'm saying it was done right after uh, Heavy Traffic. It took forever to come out because I couldn't finish it. They never wanted me to finish it. <laughs> and um, then, then, you know, I'm trying to finish Hey Good Lucky and I'm, I'm furious with it wasting my time and it's draining resources to the company and I've got to be thinking of two films all the time so I get a call from a Warner Brothers executive Roger Rabbit had just come out and it was exactly the same concept stuff five years after my Vegas looking Roger Rabbit comes out and they ask me if I still had the original print from a good looking because now they can understand that it would make money well, I went to the studio and had it out with that guy. He never spoke to me since. I don't want people to lie. I got so crazy. But that's what goes. That, that's what happened. Somewhere in this world that the, the original print of A Good Looking with the live action animated. And it's one of my best movies. The, the remake was very difficult to do. I had no money at all. And I was kind of burnt out on the film. So I don't like to talk about it too much. So I love the character. The original film was absolutely great. Yeah, that's unfortunate. My point of view. My wife who saw it. So it was, it was a heartbreak. But you know, you could go so far with these guys and then they push back on you. It was, it was very difficult. I had very good luck, but a lot of bad luck. It wasn't easy. But I'm glad I did it. You did kind of do something like that with Cool World, though. Y yes. That's what they wanted. Yeah. But Cool World was never... I can't talk about it. Okay. But I think I'm a little burnt out. I've said it awful lot. What time is it? It I is... I just got... You know, I'm an old man. I just <laughs> got very tired. Oh. Okay. No. How long, how long we got... Um, or, ask me, or ask me an easy question. Oh, or you do some talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we, we're, we're at 47 minutes. I, I was going to say, you know, um, um, did you have anything you w wanted to say about the, the last days of Corny Island, which I know you was working on? Okay, I'll, I'll say something about that. Last Days of Corny Island um, is a very strange movie. It's done. Um, I tried a technique. I did it all myself. I animated it. I did the background. Um, I did it because I wanted to... I was wrestling with a style that's very crude. I got tired of slick. I got tired... I wanted to do something that was very... Like, like the drawings weren't cleaned up and was very rough. I was trying to experiment with characters and motivations and um, go back to sort of uh, heavy traffic... With a, with a more evil intent. Uh, it's doing quite well on YouTube for my money. We're up to, you're close to 13,000 now. When I put it on, um, and I like it very much, or it's weird, this is strange. It also allowed me to discuss the Kennedy assassination, which I don't really understand, but it's very important to me. But John F. Kennedy got killed, fascinated when I was a young man. And I never, ever, believe that Oswald did it it was all alone I thought the whole thing was too bad um, and in and in the last days of Coney Island this girl gets shot and they blame somebody who did it and the guy who did it said nah Lee Harvey Oswald did it so what I'm thinking we all know that Lee Harvey Oswald did not kill Molly in my film so some other guy said bullshit, don't bullshit. So I was able to finally say that Lee Harvey Oswald did not kill Kennedy, uh, to my mind. And uh, so it was a very important thing for me. Um, it was a very important thing for me. So, but it was a piece of entertainment that's very strong, that goes against all those perfectly wonderful computer films that are out there. It allows an animator to discuss whatever you want. And I continue trying to find the voice in different styles that's appropriate for that. 
automation if, if people don't want to be just worried about selling toys or making a hundred million dollars at the box office. Now, when I say I got 13,000 people in four months to date, somebody would say that's ridiculous. Um, these computer animated films make millions of people watch it. That's not what's important to me. I got 13,000 people to like my movie. You know, 5,000 people like my movie, I feel that that was a victory. I mean, you're an artist and you should, the people who like your movie, the people who like your movie, you can't get everyone to love your movie. So to me, it's a very big success. It's not a big success, I suppose, to the guys in computer animation in Pixar and those big studios because the nine of people saw the film. Um, I'll probably reach 100,000 one day on YouTube. Um, you know what that is for an independent animator? That's yeah. a very big deal for an artist, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, money is never... I like money, it doesn't. I like to buy all kinds of art supplies. Well, you know, I love sports cars when I was a kid. I love those old MGs and everything. But I would never... Uh, consider making something um, just for the sake of money. I would like everything to make a hundred billion dollars. But I never sell out first to do that. I try to do what do I want to make. Uh, what do I think has to be made? So I'm just an old cornball. That's a 60s guy. You know, guys like me are dying sad. Today it's all about money. Merchandising. T tell me, is... Could you imagine today where you got painting? Yeah. Fine art paintings that are being sold for $250 million. You know, guys have sold their paintings for $3,000 in the 60s. That's crazy. That's crazy. Tell me, is Eddie going to follow in your footsteps? I leave my kids alone. I think he has so far. He teaches animation. Well, um, he's... He, he teaches animation and he started a program in New Mexico University. Very proud of him. He teaches a lot of young animators. He teaches 2D and 3D. He, he runs a blog. He's a very good guy. And, and um, uh, I, I don't tell my kids what to do. Hopefully they follow by uh, observation. You know, I have a lot of freedom. My parents were immigrants and they were too poor to tell me what to do. They let me do the best I could, and that's how I treat my kids. And so far, I'm very proud. Well, he's got a. Anyhow, uh, I am burnt out. I appreciate this, and if this does well, call me in a year. We'll do another one. Come around. Well, you know what, and Ralph? Let I, me know. Let me know how this has been received. We'll let Eddie know. I I will I will do that. I I thank you very very much for coming on here well, today. You are the best interviewer I've done millions of interviews. And once in a while, a guy comes along, very rarely. I'm serious, and I know what he's talking about. You have asked me some of the best questions that anyone's ever asked me, and the right questions. There aren't very many more. And, uh, I really appreciate your understanding of what I did in animation. So it was oh, a pleasure. yeah. It was a pleasure working with you. Oh, the, the pleasure's all mine, and you were worth you were worth the wait. And it's great to oh, celebrate. Thank you. It's great to celebrate the 45th 50, anniversary. 50 years. <laughs> Listen, you know what I got here? I got three dogs, my dog, staring at me. They want to eat. <laughs> <laughs> They're looking at me. Get off the phone, idiot. <laughs> well, is it so, what time is it where you are? It is uh, five to four. Okay. Yeah. Well, call me again. Let me know what's happening. I appreciate it. I will. You take care and God bless you. you we're we're celebrating right, forty five years of Fritz the Cat. Take it My easy. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye.